Okay, so I'm going to talk about matrix estimation. This is a uh, this is a based on um, a tutorial that uh, Christina Lee uh, and myself we gave at ISIT, which is the Information Theory uh, uh, Symposium uh, last year. Um, so thank you to her for sort of helping me put these things together. Uh, it's going to be very. Uh, there are parts in which it will be very different from what we did at ISIT. So if you have seen that online or something, uh, hopefully there will be something that uh, will be different than what you've seen before. What is the point of uh, this tutorial? Um, okay, so, um, <clears throat> all right, so we have um, three lectures on the topic, and then there's a fourth lecture which uh, I'm going to give on a um, uh, very closely related topic of causal inference. Now. You know, uh, matrix, okay, we, we teach matrix estimation as lecture number 22 in 26 lecture course in a machine learning class, okay? And I think it's great. It's great to sort of teach it as a one-off application, but I do feel that you know, it's a lot more than that. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I thought it would be great to put things together in terms of uh, amazing progress that has been made on the topic in last uh, 12 to 15 years. What I want to do is I want to give you a quick overview of the topic in terms of both uh, what the question is, what are the algorithms, what are the key nuggets of mathematical analysis. I don't think I will be able to go through all of those things, but I will try my best to the extent possible, point out uh, uh, some of the crucial aspects in each of those dimensions. And then I will tell you a little bit more in detail about part of uh, the topic that got me excited and interested into uh, in the matrix estimation, which is how to use non-parametric methods for doing matrix estimation. And uh, in the part two of like this three-part sequence, I will uh, use white, uh, sorry, green board, it's beautiful green board, by the way, uh, to uh, do some calculations and sort of hopefully that will give more, uh, more feeling uh, or more flavor of it. And the part three, I will talk about some of the applications. All right, so with that uh, and with this jumpy start with the mic, let me sort of slowly, I'll, I'll get into my... Uh, normal things. All right, so this is a three-part uh, description. What I want to do first is talk about model, statement, and examples. I'll give you an overview of algorithms. Uh, I'll spend um, some time talking about extremely simple algorithm called singular value thresholding. If you have seen this, great. If you've not seen this, the, uh, both algorithm and analysis are super simple. Uh, I'll walk you through the analysis from Chatterjee first, and then uh, maybe in part three, depending on how much time it is, I'll do a little bit of alternative analysis that will help us get familiar with the, the basic random matrix, uh, uh, the basic nuggets from random matrix uh, concentration inequalities. In the second part, I'll primarily spend time on non-parametric methods, and then uh, in the last part, I would like to discuss some of the black box application of matrix estimation. And this is what I meant by saying that, you know, uh, I feel that sort of matrix estimation, the way we teach, treat it, at least in our machine learning classes, is like it's a second class or third class citizenship. Maybe it should be close to one and a half class citizen, if not first class citizen. At least maybe after three lectures, you will be able to convince. And uh, if you haven't sort of yet uh, engaged yourself in this party, it's not too late. There are lots of other exciting questions that are out there that uh, we don't know how to answer, and I will talk about some of them. Uh, okay, so with that, let's get started. Okay. All right, so uh, model, statement, and examples. All right, so here's the classic example that got, uh, uh, that brought this question to its existence. Um, it's a recommendation system. Uh, it's been around since uh, 90s, since e-commerce was there, formalized in uh, early 2000 by uh, at least one of the earliest paper I know which did formal treatment of it was by Tommy Yakola and his uh, former student uh, while doing thesis at MIT. Um, so the idea is, as, you, as we all know, and uh, at the risk of repeating this maybe thousand times for each of us, there are, think of N users, M movies, and what we have a situation is that some of, some pair of user movie, we know the rating. For example, user one has rated movie one, three, okay? Lots of these uh, entries are not observed, okay? What we want to do is we want to figure out, given the partially observed matrix, what are these missing entries? The reason I want to do that is because let's suppose that user number 
I say 27, user number 27 logs in next time on this portal, say Netflix or YouTube or whatnot, and I want to figure out what is the movie that she or he would like more, okay? And well, one way I could do that is figure out all the missing entries in these movies, because the movies that he or she has already seen, there's no point of recommending them. The ones that he or she has not seen, let me figure out the ratings for that, and based on that, let's sort them and show the top five, or whatever that is. You might, your objective might be something else, and you do whatever that is, okay? Now, this is kind of gimmick. This is not how real recommendation systems work, right? I mean, real recommendation system have a lot more information. However, this, as a, a simple black box, is super useful in designing real recommendation system. So while this is sort of a, this may come across as a simple, nice, clean mathematical question, uh, as is, it's not useful, but as a subroutine, it becomes extremely useful in any production, production system. And uh, that's what is sort of amazing about this simple question. All right, so summarizing a little bit more, uh, what we have is some ground truth matrix A. Let's say the, there's an underlying matrix that we are not observing, uh, that we want to learn. We are observing the noisy versions of this matrix. For example, for small set of entries, we are observing entries, and these entries need, need not be actual values, right? Because maybe sort of your real rating is 3.75, but because I, you were asked to sort of uh, do integer, you give four, or maybe you give three, okay? So there's some noise model that relates these observations, partial observations of a matrix to the underlying ground truth matrix, and what you want to do from Y is produce estimate of A, say A hat, so that A hat is as close to A as possible. Again, a matrix, which is of your interest, you don't observe it, you observe a noisy version of it, only subset of them. From that, recover the original matrix. The first question one asks is, okay, what is a good model? Uh, I mean, if, you, if I give you arbitrary matrix, uh, I could be a terrible and adversary, and there are, you can do nothing. Okay. So clearly, we need some structure. Uh, so the question is, how do we think about this structure? Uh, as this literature started, uh, one reasonable structure that people thought was, Let's think of matrix as a low rank matrix because matrices can be represented through their singular value decomposition and the number of components, fewer the components, fewer the complexity, great, let's go and learn it. While reasonability is uh, it sort of, it leaves a feeling that I, somebody came up with the, pulled the model out of her or his hat, right? So maybe there has to be a little bit more principled way to think about this. And uh, in a sense, this is the question that got us or got me really interested into the, the topic itself. So here, was, uh, here is my interpretation, okay? So let's do a thought experiment. Uh, so let's say you, uh, you guys are really expert, which you are. So let's say you have an algorithm, ALG, okay? And this ALG uh, is this matrix estimation algorithm. That is, ALG gets input this noisy missing entry matrix Y. You take that as an input and you produce an output A as your estimation. Okay. Now, without telling you, I'm going to say that I'm going to give you another entry. But the another entry is actually generated as follows. I took the same matrix, okay? I permuted rows, I per permuted columns. Let's call that pi of y. Okay. I gave it to you. Your algorithm applied on its own on that same new matrix now and produced me. Uh, output, let's call it B hat, and let's say sort of, B, uh, okay, so you produce this B hat. Okay. So Y, A, uh, pi of Y, B hat. Or, sorry, A hat and B hat, my bad. Okay. Now the question is that, should B hat be equal to A hat, the same transformation applied to uh, A hat? It's not a trick question, right? Answer is, of course, yes. Okay, and the yes is because, well, in case if it was not the case, maybe something, uh, your algorithm is doing something they shouldn't be doing. It's like, it's reading too much into uh, the movie ID being X, Y, Z as really important. Now, if you believe that the indices contain the feature, contain some value or some information, that's a, let's call it covariate information, that's not part of the model. You're simply thinking of each index as a number which has no relevance to the information itself. What this means is that now if, if you are a probabilist or a mathematical statistician, you'll say, okay, now I know how to think about this. 
Well, the way I'm going to think about this is as follows. Let's imagine that this matrix that you and I are observing is a two-dimensional distribution, okay? Then this distribution must be permutation invariant. That is, the indices don't matter. In particular, row exchange, exchanging row indices or column indices does not matter. Now, you might say that, is it really useful or is it just one of those observations that nice to have but it's completely useless? At least turns out, uh, in this case, it is quite, uh, uh, quite meaningful quite, and uh, there's a, a beautiful work done by, of course, starting with definity for one dimensional setting, as we know, for infinite exchangeable arrays. If actually definitive theorem says that condition on the prior, the, the, um, uh, the realize, you can think of, so first you sort of have a prior, let's call it theta, but condition on that, entire sequence is, uh, acts like an IID with a distribution that depends on the prior, right? So there's one parameter you can sort of choose first, and subject to that parameter, rest of the sequence, even though it's exchangeable, now condition on this looks like it's an IID sequence. Of course, the distribution depends on the prior. So in a very similar sense, there was a very nice work done by Hoover and Aldous in late 70s, early 80s, which talks about how does one dimensional version of definity extends to uh, um, a multi-dimensional setting. In particular, when you uh, look at two dimensional setting, very clean parameterized or non-parametric uh, model comes out, and I want to focus on that. All right, uh, so if you have not looked at this, it's a, it's a great uh, set of uh, papers to read. Um, the nice, um, sort of, the, there's a nice queuing connection. Again, this, uh, this may not m matter to many of you, but if you are from POP community in Sandeep speak, then uh, Kingman matters to you. And actually, Kingman was behind this result. It's, quite a, it's beautiful history there. And it has all the connections to these, um, uh, the modern Bayesian stuff that uh, in Bayesian statistics, uh, people have been talking about the paint boxes and all that stuff. They are all related to this. All right, back to our problem. So now I've got my, gen so when I specialize this, after this thought experiment, my model becomes like this. I'm going to generate Ys as follows. Now, before I generate Ys, I need to tell you how I do I generate the ground truth, right? Because ground truth mattered. And after that, I will need to tell you how Y is related to the ground truth. So first, the way we'll generate ground truth is that each row and each column has some latent features. Okay. And uh, these uh, latent features are sampled as per uh, some IID distribution over some uh, spaces, say X1 and X2. For simplicity, you can think of x1 and x2, or in, let's say throughout, think of x1 and x2 as uh, 0, 1 to power r, where r is some parameter. So it's like you have a compact set in r-dimensional space, from which you're sampling these features per some distribution, say mu1 for rows and mu2 for columns. Now, ijth entry of the ground truth matrix is some measurable function applied to these two features. Uh, Okay, now this is, this is latent. These are latent. That means you don't observe. The thing that you observe is really Y's. Now, condition on these X's is features for rows and columns. Y is actually, Y's are independent. And expectation of Y is A. Okay. So that's the, that's the entire model. Okay. Now, uh, as you would see, so there is uh, the second example in the previous talk a very nice sort of similar relationship. There is a function f, there was this time t, and then there was um, x. So x is where row features there and y is where, uh, t is where sort of the column features, if you think about it. But I'll, I'll leave you further uh, sort of going down that analogy, but there was also a latent variable model. All right, and now what we are trying to do here is that given observation y, assuming that y is generated as per such a latent variable model, can we estimate a hat so that a hat is close to a? Okay. Now, uh, one pause for, uh, uh, let's say one example of this would be, say x1 and x2 are r-dimensional vectors, and f is just an inner product, or weighted inner product, then this is nothing but a low-rank matrix of rank r. 
of course, if I have a generic measurable, nothing would happen. So the question is that exactly. So, uh, so here is a sort of the things we want to do, right? We want to get this as well as possible. Uh, let's say with this measure for a second is a squared error because traditionally this is the uh, error metric that has been studied throughout. Uh, question is that for as small a p as possible. So what is p? I didn't introduce. I said, uh, well, let's assume this stylized model where each entry is observed with probability p. Okay. So we want to have it for as small as as small p as possible. Uh, we want as large class of functions as possible, as generic uh, uh, the latent feature space as possible, and then of course this is just a classical, but uh, this is where most of the literature has been. But I do believe strongly believe that one has to spend. I mean, different error metric have different uh, utility, and we should sort of spend time thinking about that. And I'll point out uh, uh, those things as the. Uh, the sequence of lectures will go. Especially, I'll spend time uh, talking about some of the applications like uh, principal component regression, uh, time series, uh, where different error metric will play an important role. Okay. I appreciate, by the way, people asking questions. I should have said that we should have asked. Sorry, this I'm still getting uh, back to my normal. Yes. Are all the rows drawn from the same distribution? Yes, so the question is that are all the rows drawn from the same distribution? Answer is yes. Okay. Yeah. So rows have one distribution, columns have another distribution, and then they are sort of drawn IID. Don't observe the IID, do you set the entry to default value or is it just star? Star. Question is what do you do with the algorithm? That's a yeah, question you are asking. Yeah. So we'll come to different algorithms and different algorithms do different things. Great question. Yeah. Yes. And nothing about F. Nothing about F, nothing about X. Nothing it, uh, about yeah. Now, here's a good I'm glad you asked the question. I forgot all these things I wanted to say. So, in some level, if you insisted that you want to learn X's and F's, this is ill post problem. Because I can take F and I can apply G to it, you know, instead of. Okay. What we are really trying to do here is just predict or estimate A that is consistent with our observations in a sense. So in a sense, it's more about consistency rather than model learning. So it's a weaker problem in that sense, but it's a sort of a, a lot more stringent too. Like if you were to do regression, for example, in classical regression, where regression one tries to say that I want to go from features to labels, where labels are some function of features. Uh, in this case, for example, I could say that this F is what I want to learn. These are the labels and these are the features. I observe the features. I observe the maybe labels like this. And then I try to learn F. That's classical regression. The problem is that we don't observe these features. We only observe the labels. So in that sense, it's more stringent too. So it's more demanding, but your goals are also weaker. So it's sort of a reasonable trade-off, so to speak. All right, so this is what I want to do. And here are two other, met, uh, for example, error metric of interest. Let's call this MRSC. What this says is that let me look at the squared error in any given row, okay? And then take maximum over all possible rows. Do the same for columns too. Or maximum, that is maximum over all entries. Of course, if uh, this is much stringent than this is than this, right? And so sort of that's why I, sort of I want to go from here to here to here, because each one of them will lead to different types of, it will enable different applications. Uh, and just to sort of think about, this is like a normalized Frobenius norm, this is like normalized to infinity norm, and this is like normalized infinity norm of matrices, right? So really just playing with all the matrix, matrix norms. All right, so now a few, uh, Few, few quick uh, applications. If you think of uh, these matching markets, right? Let's say people buy and sell uh, online. There's an, there's an interesting sort of um, um, marketplace called Poshmark. I don't know if you have seen it. I, I thought it was a super, super brilliant, innovative idea. So the thought is that uh, if you are, and while sort of they're focused on women, but I don't think this is true, men are equally sort of, uh, so I don't want to sort of 
do that way. But at least their pitch is the following. Women have these amazing sets of, let's say, shoes, the uh, purses, and so on and so forth that they have bought. Let's say, think from Prada or something like that, or Gucci. And they used it for three years. It's beautiful, nicely kept. Now they want to sell it and they want to sort of uh, get something else. But there was no marketplace like that. Now they want to sell it. Now, so you are a seller. You take a picture with the app and you say, I'm ready to sell for $150. You, another person on the same app, is a buyer. You can buy it. The problem is that you got sort of roughly 20 million or so people who are selling at the same time and roughly 20 million of people who are want to buy. Now, which of the 20 million should you see on your screen, which is like three pictures space? Okay. What I really want to know is that maybe once in a while she has sold something to him. Sorry, okay, maybe. She has sold something to her and information like that, based on that, I want to find out what's the likelihood that he's going to buy something from her. Okay, because if I do all of these things, then you, I use the same way as before, and I can sort of start matching things to people. Okay, and this is a real thing. Actually, this was a real thing. Uh, at some point in time, I spent time talking to the folks at Poshmark, but, uh, and I'm not affiliated with them. But it's a, it's a great sort of data set that they had. Uh, same thing with Ubers and Lyfts and all that, because again, people, riders, and all that. Uh, take any other sort of uh, two-sided human market, basically. This is true, and this is how they want to match. Now, as you think about that, clearly this is closely related to something like LinkedIn, right? Um, let's say I and Sandeep are connected to LinkedIn. I don't know if we are connected, but let's say hypothetically we are connected. Then, the, But I and Vivek are not connected, so the question is that LinkedIn should effectively recommend me that I should connect with uh, Vivek or Ganesh for that matter, or any one of you, right? How would it know? If it's only using its own LinkedIn data, really, it has sort of this uh, realization of graph structure like this. And based on that, you want to find out what's the likelihood of these two people having an edge. Now, a very nice model for these kind of evolving graph is what's called graphons, okay, where the idea is that probability uh, of any two in individuals or any two nodes connecting, say PIJ, is some function of theta i comma theta j, where theta i, theta j are parameters associated with nodes i and j. Okay? And that, of course, is a special case of this, and it's not a surprise because um, after, let's say, Loas and Zagidi sort of established their uh, asymptotic result, clearly folks realize that this is nicely related to this exchangeability world. And a special case of Graphon is what's called stochastic block model or community detection, where you know there are two communities uh, people within the same community connect with probability P, people not from same community connect with probability Q. All we know is that we just observe edges again, zeros and ones. Can we figure out from this, uh, what are the entries? Again, in this case, it's just a rank two. Very nice setting of our model. Can we figure out sort of these entries really well? Because if I could figure out these entries really well, let's say with respect to the infinity norm, then I could actually do, um, a community detection really well. Okay. Now, all of these questions have different ways in which people have sort of studied, uh, but the point is I think they're all part of the matrix estimation, so why don't we study in one coherent manner rather than different, different algorithms and so on. All of that is work in progress, right? Okay. Uh, here is another example of ranking. Let's say people are playing with each other, and uh, this is the number says that how often she defeats her while playing chess and vice versa. On the, the other entry where maybe uh, this one and, sorry, this one is the entry that she defeats her twice and she defeats her twice. Okay, so I've got pairwise comparison things and so whenever two individuals play with probability, there's a pij is a probability with which i is going to defeat j. One minus pij which is pji with, res with respect to which j is going to defeat i. And what I'm trying to, based on just few um, comparisons, like how often, let's say, Federer and uh, Nadal play, and sort of 10 times Federer won, five times, or zero times Nadal won. Well, you know whose fan I am. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, based on that, I want to figure out what is the right PIJ. Okay? And I want to do that for the every one. And if this is, these PIJs are generated as per a nice distributional model, like uh, multinomial logit model or so on, can I sort of learn that from just partial observation? Right? Again, this is an instance of um, uh, uh, matrix estimation. Okay, 
Last one is crowdsourcing. Um, okay, maybe in interest of time, I'm going to skip this. All right. Uh, distance matrix in Euclidean space, another low rank. So it's a nice exercise. Argue that if uh, it's, this is um, Euclidean distance, then this matrix has a low rank. Uh, depends on dimension. Okay. Or so, quite a few examples. All of these examples directly map to the problem I told you. I'll come back to in the part three of the lectures where I will show you uh, uh, how matrix estimation can be used as a black box to solve many other problems. Okay. So now let's look at the set of all algorithms that are out there. Remind us, A is what we want, Y is what we observe, A hat is what we want to produce so that this error is small. For the time being, we'll focus on uh, MSC, that is squared error, normalized or Frobenius norm, but uh, then we, we will sort of go to other norms. Okay, so here is, uh, as well as I could do, try to fit everything in one slide. So maybe sort of from a few years from now, it may not be one slide. All right, so that is roughly, okay. One, one view of all algorithms is there's a matrix factorization style. There are optimization-based algorithm, and there is this non-parametric methods, okay? Um, among matrix factorization, the simplest one, which is singular value thresholding, which uh, depending on how quickly I go, will analyze that. Super, super simple. I mean, it's like, uh, as simple as it gets, but remarkably powerful. And uh, we'll focus on this uh, a nice universal version of this by Chatterjee. Uh, there are variations of this, which are called hard singular value and soft singular value. We'll come back to hard later in the third lecture uh, because it has nice, uh, uh, nice geometric properties. Optimization is a convex relaxation, and now, uh, lately, there's a beautiful literature coming up for non-convex, uh, uh, viewing this problem as a non-convex and just directly attacking, attacking it. For convex relaxations based on nuclear norm minimization, I'll describe that as a long literature. Uh, for non-convex setting, that is effectively, either you start with a good initialization coming from something like this, or you just start. Okay, and then there are a variety of different local um, uh, iterative algorithms. For example, a gradient descent or alternative least squares or variations of all of these, like the stochastic version of it. Okay. They're all brothers and sisters of each other. But in a nutshell, these are simple iterative algorithms. And what's, uh, what is remarkably interesting is that this paper of uh, Sun and Luo in 2014-2015 identified this. It's a beautiful uh, result, which generalizes what we knew about matrices since 1980s, is that um, uh, uh, even sort of in um, under sort of this noisy setting, the local minima of these algorithms, which are which where you can get stuck, is same as global minima, and global minima turns out to be the right thing to do. I'll spend some time on this in the third lecture. Uh, and th this is really interesting. Also, uh, this is the only example in which if you look at the two-layer neural network, where one knows sort of uh, some non-trivial analysis. And two-layer neural network in this case is nothing but this matrix factorization. It's just a disguised. So uh, I think for that reason, if one wants to study maybe uh, neural networks, Matrix or as matrix factorization or tensor factorization are good case studies to build intuitions. And finally, nearest neighbor, these are non-parametric methods. This is nice connections to collaborative filtering. I'll talk about that in a second. All right. So these are the three classes of algorithms. Now let me spend some time just giving you a little bit more flavor for each one of them. And then uh, uh, whatever time remains, I will do analysis of this. And then we'll stop. Okay, so singular value thresholding. So this is the question that you asked. Okay, why is the one where you got stars? What do you do with stars? Because I'm going to do singular value thresholding, and before that I do SVD. I can't do SVD of a matrix with stars. Okay, so here is what uh, one suggestion, replace it by zero. A better suggestion, which works much better in practice, is uh, you replace it by uh, row, um, sorry, column or row means. Okay, um, the better suggestion, which works even better in practice, is you 
start with replacing column or row means, then you do SVD, and let's say apply this algorithm, use that as a replacement for column and row means and do again, and do again, and do again. Okay. And that works beautifully. Um, I don't know how to prove anything about it, but there's so many simulations I've done where that version of algorithm works almost as good as uh, ALS, where implementing ALS is alternative least squares we'll talk about. It's too much work. Okay. All right, so what does this algorithm say? After you have replaced missing values or stars in Y by zeros, now you've got full matrix. Uh, let's say M by N, N by M matrix. Do singular value decomposition of it. This is just classic singular value decomposition, so you got, uh, okay. Now what you do is that keep top few component, that is take these sigmas, sort them in decreasing order. Let's say assume that sigma one is the largest, sigma two is second largest and so on. Keep the sigmas which are larger than some threshold, okay. You can keep threshold by saying that I'm going to keep top five, so that's like based on number, or you can say I'm going to keep all the sigmas that are larger than some t. Once you keep them, rest you throw away, and then you have a hat, which is some normalizing constant uh, multiplied by this. And that's it. Okay. So this is your first matrix estimation algorithm. And it is extremely good, actually. It's surprisingly. I mean, you can improve on it. But to first order, this is as good as it gets. So take your matrix, missing values replaced by zero, do singular value thresholding. Let's find top components of this guy. And that's it. All right. So now optimization-based algorithm. So this is like the classical risk minimization or minimization framework. So why is that my observations? I want to find Z, okay? I want to find Z that minimizes something, okay? And of course, that's close to Y. Like saying the same thing, that is, I've got Y, I want to find Z, that so I want to find Z that minimizes something here with minimize rank, and that was close to Y. Here we did not sort of impose that close to Y. We believed that this will keep it close to Y, right? But why not just explicitly impose that as a con condition? Hopefully that will do better. Okay. Now you can say minimization. What is this objective? Well, it could be rank, uh, but rank is not easy to minimize, and so as known from, let us say, in controls literature, this was for a variety of other reasons well studied, uh, is rank has a convex relaxation called nuclear norm, which effectively says that take your matrix, write down its SVD, and then some of the singular values. Take an L1 norm. Like L2 norm is just Frobenius, uh, the Frobenius norm of matrix. L1 norm is nuclear norm. So you minimize this instead of rank, and this is the optimization you get. So it's a nice surrogate to what you wanted to do. Uh, turns out, again, sort of this is well known in controls literature that this is equivalent. I mean, as is, it doesn't look like easy to solve, but it has a very nice, uh, uh, f very nice view, which says that you got, if actually you're minimizing trace, and then these two Ws are auxiliary matrices, and they satisfy certain STB conditions, okay? What you should take away is that sort of there is an efficient integer point method to solve these kind of questions, okay? Now, efficient means, uh, doesn't mean sort of uh, linear time, right? STPs are hard to solve, but it's polynomial. So I doubt anybody would implement this in practice, but that's my view. All right, so there was a optimization. Now, the non-convex view. Non-convex view is even simpler. It says, well, look, I want to find Z. Z has, uh, uh, let's say, it has decomposition UV transpose. Think of, um, I'm, I'm sort of feeding my, the singular values to one of these matrices, okay? Let's say, instead of u sigma, v transpose sigma is, let's say, part of v. Okay. Now, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm, my zij is ui transpose vj. ui transpose vj is my zij. yij is what I've observed. 
I want to minimize the error between them. And since the only observations are over the set of indices over which I observed, I'm going to restrict my minimization to only those entries. And subject to this, let me find any U's and V's. Okay, now you can sort of say that should I sort of keep the, uh, the norm restricted? Don't do that, otherwise you will have to sort of get the sigmas in. Okay. All right, so how do we do that? Uh, now this is, this is non-convex, okay? If you had a full matrix, then sort of this non-convex optimization from say some result in 80s, we know that it can be solved and it has a, a unique minimization and unique minimization exactly corresponds to the, the singular value decomposition of the matrix, right? Or in, if it's we restrict to R, the top R, uh, uh, the top R components of the matrix. But in this case, this is noisy version and not all entries. So that's why sort of it's not clear what will happen. As I've told you, there are recent results which argue that under certain setup, this still the same story holds true even in the noisy setting and missing entries. Okay. Now, with that view, if uh, alternative Lee squares or ALS as it goes, what says that, or it says that let's, do, let's look at, assume that Vs are fixed. That is, these Vs are fixed. I'm trying to find Us, and I know Ys. So this is like, uh, U, Vs I know, they are my features. This is the model parameter that I don't know, and these are my labels. So effectively, I'm doing regression, the classical least squares. That means I can solve this very quickly. And I can solve this for every different i's, that is u1, u2, ui, separately in parallel. Okay, so fixed v's, I can solve for u's in parallel quickly. Now fix u and do the same for v's and keep iterating. Okay, that's it. That's the alternative least squares. Okay, uh, if you want to do the gradient version, then you'll say, okay, the same thing. That's my objective, and now I want to sort of maybe take the, uh, the gradient with respect to F, uh, or so, compute the gradient of F with respect to U and Vs. You have this nice form. You do the you do the stochastic version of it. All of that uh, bells and whistles. Everything will work. So, but these are these gradient style algorithms and alternative least square. Both of these are uh, looking for solving non-convex view of the problem through simple iterative method. And it's not clear why they should go and find the global minima, which is the right global minima. Uh, again, what is a really interesting and nice result is, uh, especially in recent line of work, which argues that under certain conditions, not as strong as what we know for other methods, but under certain conditions, uh, these algorithms do converge to the global minima because all local minima are global minima. Okay. Uh, there's again sort of hybrid version that people think about that is initialized with SVD, truncate it, and then sort of from there you improve it. But now that's sort of what we know, maybe a hybrid algorithm is autism. Just do it. Okay. All right. So, and the last set of algorithms. Uh, Non-parametric or nearest neighbors. In a sense, these were the f yes. So when you say all local minima, global minima, is it because the value of the objective is zero? All of them are using the best possible thing, or is it something else? Uh, no. So actually, so if you're classical, let's say, forget noise, and forget missing value entries. Let's say I have actual matrix, and if I wrote down that objective or that optimization, we are actually trying to find, let's say best rank R approximation to the matrix. And we know that there's a unique solution to that. And that is unique minima. And there are no other local minima for that too, for that reason. Now, the same thing holds, so in some sense, because of this noise and all that, uh, let's say this is the view, somehow it's getting perturbed, but it's not perturbed enough. And the question is that how much is not perturbed enough depends on what fraction of data you observe and how much noise you add. So those are the conditions that people argued that so somehow that view uh, which is in perfect setting is robust to noise and missing value to some extent.
And, and the, um, uh, the, maybe I'll sort of, I have slides in the lecture three, so I'll walk you through it. The, the analysis is this clever observation that is, if you try to um, do probability for uh, in a, a too refined a sort of concentration at too refined uh, level, nothing will work. But if you somehow do it for certain linear functionals, it works beautifully, and that's what you need. Um, okay. All right. So nearest neighbors. Uh, these are, in a sense, the oldest algorithms for matrix estimation. The first reference that I know was in 1991 by Goldberg et al. These are the guys who were at Amazon. Uh, Amazon e-commerce started and they wanted to figure out how to recommend things to people, the natural question. And their view was very simple, like how do you and I do recommendations? Well, if I want to know where to eat well in Mumbai, of course I know whom to ask, is Sandeep or Vivek, right? And uh, I'm pretty sure the same thing is true for you. If you are here and if you want to sort of eat really well, I'm going to figure out in the next couple of hours whom to ask. People ask people. And the reason people ask people, because I know that these, are, these guys have amazing taste, not only in food, but everything else too. So I'm going to sort of ask them. So how do you, what is the mathematization of or algorithmization of that? Well, here are two users. I want to find out my preference for movie. I don't know. I'm going to look at the users who have similar preference for other movies and extrapolate it, okay? That's user user. There's nothing secret about rows. Columns can be used too. So that's called item item, the same story, okay? And of course, then there's a whole sort of intermediate interplay. How do you do user and item together, okay? And we'll discuss that a little later. Uh, extensively used in practice, very scalable. It's got nice connection to this approximate nearest neighbor. It is nearest neighbor. It has incrementality. It has got this interpretation thing, like, you know, people say, like, you like good fellas because you like that and so on and so forth. And it has nice conceptual relationship to this classical uh, non-parametric method. And that's what got me interested into this. So those are the all classes of algorithms very quickly. Any questions? Okay, so, so far I've told you about the problem statement, uh, a model, why the model, okay? And then we discussed the class of algorithms that are out there. Uh, Three types of algorithms, matrix factorization, the simplest one, then the optimization based convex and non-convex, and then um, the nearest neighbor non-parametric. Now in remaining, say, 11 minutes, I want to analyze singular value thresholding. That's matrix factorization, okay, the simplest version. Okay. And as you shall see, it's uh, actually, uh, my hope is I'll go through the most of the proof subject to the calculations that I can't do on the fly. But hopefully you will do it. All right, so again, ground truth matrix, Y is at the observations, and all we know is that expectation of Y is A, okay? So here it's important for you, me to point this out, that Y equals to not A plus uh, symmetric zero mean Gaussian noise. Y could be zero and one, right? So if I can observe something which is one or zero, it's like a coin toss. I'm gonna to observe one coin and I'm gonna tell you it's bias. Isn't it fascinating? Well, I can't tell it alone. I have to sort of look at many other things. In that sense, if you have uh, heard of in the, in the statistics, there's this thing called um, uh, Stein's paradox, right? I mean, the matrix estimation in my mind is the right view for the Stein's paradox because uh, you can't do it alone, but if you collaborate it enough, you can actually do much better. Okay. So we got this Y, we want to find A. Um, let's assume that A is either rank R or let's assume it's Lipschitz. So this is the question that sort of uh, somebody asked, so how general or how restrictive we'll keep. So uh, I'll go as general as Lipschitz function. Of course, if you have holder continuity, you will get a little better result. Analytic function, you'll get better result, and rank R is the sort of the simplest version. Okay. Uh, you can have noise where it's IID zero you know, mean, for example, or arbitrary, say, sub Gaussian. Uh, Ys are sort of the random variable with the right mean, but uh, they have sub Gaussian, for example. Uh, depending on how, how sort of I figure my notes out for lecture three, I might do the sub exponential version. Uh, We'll see. Okay, and again, the primary focus is find minimal scaling of number of observations so that our error, approximation error goes to zero. Okay. 
All right, so uh, now I'll talk, tell you this universal version of singular value thresholding. And the in the earlier algorithm, I didn't tell you the threshold, and I didn't tell you the normalization constant, right? Those are the two things I didn't tell you. So now I'll tell you the threshold, and the threshold is independent of the matrix. In a sense, you put down the threshold even before you start the algorithm, and that's why it's called universal. And that's what is uh, intellectually very something neat about it. You may not use this in practice. What you might actually in practice do is that actually take the Y and sort of plot its spectrum and see where the knee is or where the sort of that cutoff is, and then sort of put your uh, what do you say? Put your finger on that and sort of take everything before and after. But it's it's very neat here. So as before, you have Y, you do singular value decomposition, you take all the singular values that are larger than two times. For the purpose of this thing, let's say M equals to N, let's say it's symmetric, so that we don't worry about these mins and maxes. So it's two times square root of N times square root of P hat. Where P hat is the proxy of P that you have from observation. Is what fraction of entries you've observed. Really, all this says is that Look at all the singular values that are larger than two times square root of n p, okay? And uh, everything that's smaller than that, you don't. And why does this make sense? Okay, so here is the intuition. The intuition is that y can be written as expectation of y plus y minus expectation of y, right? So. So y can be written as expectation of y. And let's assume for a second p is 1. So this is a plus now this is a matrix with, let's call this q, uh, q i j in q r independent, 0 mean. Okay, and they've got, let's say they are bounded or they have sub Gaussian. Okay. These random matrices, so let's say actually j just for simplicity, think of QIJ is Gaussians with mean zeros and variance one. So this is a Gaussian random matrix. For Gaussian random matrix, we know that um, its spectrum, that is its singular values, if it's n by n, its singular values the largest singular value scale like two square root of n, okay? And this is a very sharp result. So that means that what this says is that this is the signal whose singular values will be much larger than this noise. I will capture the signal and I'm going to getting, get rid of noise. So that's all that is there. So really, again, um, the whole point is that to argue that random matrices, which are zero mean entries, the independent, sub-Gaussian, their largest singular value or their spectral norm is no more than this. Then what I can do is that I can take away all my components in my matrix there are smaller or that, there will be noise. And the ones that are left, which are just signal. Now, of course, that signal might have been infected a little bit by noise because uh, things like Gaussian are sort of uh, spherically symmetric, so they add sort of noise in every dimension. That's small error, but that's a small error that we will incur and we want to bound it, okay? At least intuitively, that's what's happening. Yeah. Um, so, in the latent variable model, we assume that condition on the uh, condition on um, the row and column features, y's are independent. Okay, and so now, uh, for all of these things to work out, you don't need that independence. For example, if you have just row independence, columns can be terribly dependent. But if your rows are independent then uh, very similar results will hold. Uh, again, we don't need um, uh, sub-Gaussianity, even if it's sub-exponential, similar things will hold too. 
But then again, that gets a little involved. Correct, correct. So in some sense, um, uh, um, so one is assuming that you got, uh, let's say, uh, where did I say? Uh, let's say you got, so for example, our bounded support. Okay, or you got a sub-Gaussian norm. Any other question? Okay, so maybe in three minutes, uh, uh, I hope this at least gives the intuition. Okay, so let's see. So the basic theorem says that mean squared error under, uh, let's say, let's say m equals to n, that's Chatterjee's result, m equals to n, p n minus one plus epsilon, then the mean squared error scales like this, which effectively says that as long as my nuclear norm of my ground truth matrix is doesn't scale faster than square root of mn, uh, everything is good. And this is pretty relaxed setting, right? Because, uh, I mean, if you have rank R, then you're really thinking of sort of um, uh, much smaller nuclear norms. So this allows it to sort of be much larger than otherwise. Okay. Uh, also, you can't hope to get better than, uh, say, one over n kind of scaling. This is epsilon. Uh, in this result, maybe sort of log to power 6n works uh, if you refine it and make it make a little better. For specific noise models, we know how to go till maybe logs. Now, it, this depends on your flavor of your interest. If you care about getting exact sharp thing, then this is really interesting. If you don't, then like, who cares about logs between friends? Uh, all right, so how does this work? Um, Really, it boils down to arguing that, um, see why, if it was missing values, then it will be P here. So that's the mean matrix. This is the original matrix, which is what we're looking at. We're going to bound that to be smaller than uh, uh, something like this, but with P there. Okay. Uh, so let's say there is, uh, these slides will be, can be made available, yeah. So let's say there is a sort of a simple proof depending on, uh, there are many different ways to prove this fact. Uh, for example, uh, Terry Tao's blogs on random matrix stuff has uh, other nicer, simpler alternative proof to this kind of fact. Uh, here is the one based on uh, simple calculations of uh, paths and traces and so on and so forth, because it brings out this log to power six and requirement. A uh, little bit of concentration. Um, and what you get is that the norm of this matrix that you cared about, uh, the y minus this, is no more than two times sigma square root, or two times m square root of m times p. Sigma is the proxy of square, it's a square root of p, okay? All right, so let's assume for a second that we have this, then how do we argue that uh, the mean squared error is small? Okay, so, Suppose I use y by p as my, as my estimation, then really this is what I'm getting. This is what I'm, now here's what I'm doing. y minus pa, the Frobenius norm error, which is what MSC is, okay, I need to stop. But this is what I want to bound. I'm gonna say this is no more than the spectral norm times r. When can I say that? Well, I can say that if both y and uh, let's say this difference matrix is rank r. Because this is nothing but sigma one square, sigma two square, sigma r square of this matrix. This is less than or equal to r times the sigma one square of the matrix, right? That's, ex that's all I'm writing. Now that's true only if these are r components. Well, I know that a is rank r, let's say, but I don't know if y is the same case. So I want to make this argument true, even though it's not really true, but approximately true. Okay. But if, I, if this was true, then we'll ex get exactly what we wanted. Okay. So I want to replace R by nuclear norm of A. That's what I want to do. Okay. And uh, there is one simple, uh, and I think this is the crux of uh, Chatterjee's paper, this simple lemma, uh, everything else is standard. This simple lemma that sort of bounds uh, the Frobenius norm 
uh, of this guy is a function of the nuclear norm and the spectral norm in this really nice way. So if you sort of, you know, if you're building your toolkit for things, especially if you are, uh, uh, then remember this. This is a nice, nice in, uh, inequality. It'll come handy someday. Okay. Once you put that, do similar analysis, things will go through and you will get what you want. Okay. So I think sort of, uh, uh, just to, again, quickly summarize, the way proof will go is that you take your, um, take your matrix of interest, argue that this matrix has small spectral uh, norm because of the matrix concentration, and then use this nice inequality and complete the proof. Okay. All right. Uh, one thing is that sort of the way sort of this proof goes, it's only on for Frobenius norm or MSC. It doesn't work for, for example, the MRS or max things. Um, again, depending on how uh, things work out. For the variation of this singular value, which is the hard, hard singular value thresholding just like this, that is, I fix the threshold carefully, uh, will argue that actually you can do this MRSC bound as well. But it requires using the geometry of the, uh, the thresholding operator uh, rather than this kind of argument. And if you want to do max, I don't know how to do it for this kind of approach, but maybe for non-parametric method, we can discuss that. So with that, uh, let me just leave you this table. Uh, these are, in a sense, uh, if you're keeping scorecard for sample complexity, sort of one way to sort of measure how good algorithm or analysis are both are. Uh, the Chatterjee for Lipschitz and low rank function argued that uh, for arbitrary noise model, um, for a pro the MSC guarantee, you get this is the, these many samples you need for uh, R dimensional setup or rank R setup. Uh, there's a nice subsequent analysis by Jiaming Zhu for uh, instead of just Lipschitz, that's a holder continuous function, so you got more structure into the things. And what he argued is that sort of now the number of samples instead of scaling like, effectively this is, see, this is almost like N square. N square is like you're not getting anything for large R. He argued that for large R, let's say if alpha and R are same, then you do, it's like N square, but if alpha is much larger than the latent dimension or in which your latent variable live, then actually you gain a lot. And if you take, uh, alpha, take the analytic uh, function limit, then you can get N polylog N. All right, so there was, uh, I know this lecture wasn't exactly the way I planned it went. It was a little choppy, but I hope I communicated most of the pieces. We can, we can cut into that. What we'll do is we'll start uh, maybe in uh, exactly, I guess, 12, 10 by this one. Okay. 12, 5 by this one. No, 12, 10 by this one. 12, 10 by this one. Yeah, and then go for an R. Then go for, uh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you.